Okay, let's see if, the, yeah, it's working. So um, I read that piece from Aristotle as a preface to the lecture today because what we're seeing emerge here is something we did not see, let's say, in Minoan Crete, where we had uh, a palace, a royal household, and a sort of courtyard around it. What we have now is a complex kind of public space which begins to emerge, and as far as I can tell, it is the first of its kind to emerge. It will not be the last. Um, and that is the Agora. Uh, the red on here, for your reference, is the period of time that we are covering um, here. And you can see that it ends with the, with the death of Alexander and then in um, 322, the death of, uh, of Aristotle. Um, to refresh your memory, this is the Bronze Age city of uh, Mycenae. Uh, these are the people who wrote in a kind of proto-Greek, a linear B, Indo-European language. And um, we just, to, again, to refresh your memory, uh, you had an inner city, an upper city here, which consisted of a royal palace called a Megaron, just above my finger. Um, see if I can point, use the cursor here, right there, with a court in front of that, and then a temple that was associated with it, then a sort of royal road that led up to this staging area, and then this sort of secondary city that we see here, and then a tertiary city that was outside the walls, a kind of lower city, which was the domestic parts of the city, and also the workshops and other kinds of things, stores, markets, and so on, with water supply that we see here protected at the postern gate. Um, whoops. Well, Athens was, in fact, a Mycenaean city as well, a small one. Uh, it is separated um, by the Gulf of Corinth from uh, the Argolid, or the Peloponnesus, the Peloponnesian Peninsula, where, which was the headquarters of this Bronze Age civilization. Nonetheless, it was a small um, and, at the time, we assume, somewhat insignificant Mycenaean Bronze Age city that was located here, as we see on this rock outcrop, which today we know as the Acropolis. Uh, the lower city, as it developed, appears to have moved down into this flat area that we see here, also a kind of flat rock, which is called the Areopagus, which is at a lower level. Um, we notice here in this archaeological map that we have a spring house, again, a protected water supply, uh, that there are some Mycenaean houses going down the north slope of the Acropolis that we see here, and then we have an inscription that dates all the way back. Um, you'll also notice down here, we'll see in a detail in a moment, that there were graves down in the site that will emerge as the political space, as the public space. Um, the area that you see here is, this is a Google Earth image of Athens. The area that we see here is called the Placa. It dates to um, really the Middle Ages, although I think its form probably is not that different from what was there uh, actually in the classical city. Uh, but the houses themselves are, are much more recent. The area of the Agora will emerge right here, and this is the site of the Areopagus that we see here. So that um, if we look at it then in the Mycenaean city, what we see is that there was some evidence here of a probable site of a Megaron, which is sort of underneath part of the Erechtheon, uh, which is built in the classical period. Uh, this area that we see right here, the steps are still visible. And there is, in fact, a Mycenaean cistern that went down uh, deep into the rock of the Acropolis on its north slope uh, so that you could actually, um, in time of attack, uh, you could survive with water. Now, you've seen this map before. This is the um, evidence of a Dorian invasion, uh, possibly also invasions by the Sea Peoples. But when in a very short period of time, there seems to be about 100 years, there seems to have been simultaneous uh, destruction of most of these Greek cities, these Bronze Age cities in the Greek world, and as well as on the island of Crete and over on the Ionian shore in Anatolia, what is now Turkey, which was then part of the Aegean Greek world. And with that, um, the Greek world goes into, this Bronze Age Greek world goes into a kind of decline, which is called the archaic, or prior to that, called the Dark Age, until it will begin to emerge again around um, the 9th to the 8th century uh, BC um, as what is called the Archaic Age. And you can see here this art that we see if we compare that image um, 
of this bowl that we see to, for example, the slides that we saw last time, both Mycenaean and certainly Minoan art, uh, there's a kind of decline, almost like stick figures, like my granddaughter had drawn them. And then slowly during this ar archaic age, you have what is called a geometric style or proto-geometric style. You begin to see the emergence of more fluid, fully fleshed out figures, such as this. We also see this kuros that we see here. And just so that you understand that everything was not, in fact, white, I have included um, uh, this painted image of uh, Okuros, um, which indicates these things were very, very colorful. Some of them still retain little bits of dye in, in, the, in the stone. Um, so it looks to that the, um, the succession of movement off of the high ground, off of the Bronze Age city, out to the Areopagus, begins in the Mycenaean period. We can imagine that it retracts. Uh, and then it begins to, in the Archaic period, move outward again until eventually uh, we come down into this flat area that is at the bottom of the Areopagus with a street or a road uh, called the Panathenaic Way, which actually then connects it back up to the Acropolis. There we see a detailed aerial balloon shot of it. The dashed red line is more or less the boundary of it. It was bounded, and it had boundary stones, and only citizens were allowed in that space. If you were a woman, you were not allowed in that space. All right? Um, now, in this detail shot that we see up here, these are Mycenaean shaft graves that we see here and here. Very, exactly, the Tholos tombs, exactly the same thing that we saw in, uh, in Mycenae. And um, by the Archaic Age, these had, in fact, been sort of covered over, forgotten about, right? A, a serious break, cultural break, occurred over about a 300-year period. And um, the earliest man-made structures that, other than these graves that begin to appear here, is water supply, which would indicate, of course, that there's at least plans, if not actual occupation, plans to actually occupy this flattened area. The oldest is the Southeast Fountain House. It is followed somewhat shortly thereafter with the Southwest Fountain House, and then much later in the Hellenic period, uh, the classical period, here with water supply, a fountain house associated with the official um, instruments of the government of the city. Now, um, there we see it as these fountain houses, and then eventually the area is bounded and it is set aside and identified as this place of assembly. Um, so the space that we will be talking about today consists of a few important uh, buildings, building types, but also institutions that face out onto this flat area which carried the name orchestra. Orchestra. It's where our name orchestra comes from. Uh, the reason that people Lots of people playing instruments is called an orchestra is because of where the, they sat during a performance, which was down in this flat place in front of the stage, which was called the orchestra in a theater. Okay? Now, I want to play a word game with you for a moment before we get into this, and that is, um, you all know this from probably high school history, but the, the top of the Greek pantheon of gods on Olympus, what was his name? Zeus, how do you spell that? Z-E-U-S, Z-E-U-S, right? Zeus. All right, there is a word in Latin very similar. Anybody in here a Roman Catholic Christian? No? Te Deum, te deum Ladamus, what does that mean? Uh, we praise the old God, Deus in Latin. Deus, Zeus, we have another one, Theus, right? Theology, right? We have another one called theory, another one called thesis, and something called what? A theater. And it actually is derived from the space of religious assembly that was associated with the cult of Dionysus. Okay? There's stuff in the, that I wrote in the course folder that you should read about the Dionysus. It's probably Egyptian in origin. It's probably related to Osiris. It's too obscure. We don't know but the coincidences are astonishing. Um, 
So here we have this map. So we have this flat area called the orchestra, which we associate with theatrical space today. Uh, but again, there is a relationship between this concept of theus, this orchestra, the theater, uh, space of the theater, the space of performance. And there's another clue in here, which is the name of uh, this main street that uh, cuts diagonally through the space of the Agora, which is called the Dromos. Now, in uh, a ritual of any sort, there are two parts of a ritual um, which are important. The part spoken, which in Greek is called the muthos. It's where the word myth comes from, English word myth. The muthos, the part spoken. And then uh, the dromos, which is the part acted out. It is etymologically related to drama, although uh, dramatos, or in Greek, is different than, but they, they share the same um, proto-Indo-European root. Um, dromos, then, is this procession that moves through the political space and up to the Acropolis. More on that later. Dromos, the part in a ritual acted out. Okay? And then along the left side here, uh, which would be the west side facing east, uh, we see a series of buildings. The Bulletarian, which is a council house. This is where the heads of the tribal families met. And then the Tholos, which is a round building, which is thought to have been a kind of dining room based upon the barbecue pits that have been excavated in association with it. Um, it isn't clear whether that was a temple that later got abandoned and was actually uh, reused as something else. And then the stoa, a type of building that will come into play here in a moment. And then the stoa basilios, an interesting word, basilios. It meant the king archon, the king, the archon, the head of the council that met, or the bull, that met in the bulletarian. Um, this word will um, continue in the Latin basilica, although um, there's no, as we'll see when we get to Rome, there is no actual building type in the Greek world equivalent to the Roman basilica. So it has some relationship, but it's fairly obscure as to what it is. And then of critical importance is, of course, the Southeast Fountain House and the Southwest Fountain House. And then a building about which there is a great deal of controversy, this, which for years uh, on all of the drawings by J. Travelos was called the Heliaea, which means a law court. And now it um, apparently was something associated, there's some theory that it was not that, uh, that that was actually up here. And so I have put that in parenthesis with a question mark. This part cannot be excavated. Unfortunately, in the 19th century, a train track was cut through here, which took all this out. Um, so it's gone. Now, the Southeast Fountain House, as I've said, you have to have clean water in, dirty water out. So they began to bring fresh water in from uh, a distance. Remarkable, remarkable level of sophistication of plumbing. Uh, all gravity flow into this building that we see in section here the remains of which are right here behind this little Byzantine church. And uh, the way these things worked, um, I'll explain in a minute. Here, there you see the pipes. This is in an excavation. There it is in its original state. There it is in its ruined state, complete with some fairly sophisticated junctions, clean outs. There you see a clean out and so forth in case any dead animals or debris or anything gets down in there. Uh, it's probably easier to understand if we look at the one at Corinthos, at Corinth, even though this one was remodeled by the Romans sometime in the second century A.D., thus the arches and the superimposed uh, pilasters on these arches that we see across the back. And the way they worked is that you would have potable water coming in. Uh, if we go back and take a look at that section, you will see that potable water is being piped in here, and then it spills over into a shallow pool, which is sort of gray water that can be used for laundry and other kinds of things like that. So what you're actually getting for household consumption, what you're getting to cook your beans with, and so on and so forth, is actually coming from this potable water source, which is protected back in here. You would carry your amphora or your jug. You would fill it up. You would go back to your house and so forth. Uh, if you were wealthy enough, you may have had a well or some other cistern or some other 
source, but this was the public water supply, which was simultaneously a kind of gift from the gods. There's a lot of myths associated with this particular fountain, the so-called nine-headed fountain about a goddess who was stopped there, and she was weeping for her children who had died, and that produced the spring, the Pyrene fountain, and so on. Um, lots of myths of, uh, of, of origin. Well, at some point in the 6th century, uh, after a series of tyrants had ruled, uh, a man named Cleisthenes uh, came to actually um, institute a crucial reform. And we don't want to dwell on this in a course on the history of urban form, but it's important to understand that what you're looking at here are actually the heads of these ten tribes. There were ten sort of tribes that um, ultimately were the land titles were mixed up. He sort of, uh, there's some evidence that he forced some intermarriage and other things because what he was trying to do, as Bud Peterson would say, there's one Georgia Tech. He was trying to create one polis, one city, right, so that these rival families and rival tribes would no longer uh, have power. And he reorganized it into geographic territory. And of these smaller units, which were called dems or deems, deme, which is where the word democracy is derived, by the way. Um, these were the old townships, villages, or neighborhoods which had existed for centuries. They were somewhat independent units with their own local officials and administrators, like any small town in the United States would be today. Altogether, there were about 140 of these, and he created a way of bringing these people together in this bulletarion, in this council, and in the space called, in some other cities, called an ecclesiasterion, an ecclesia, which actually then had to do with sort of self-rule. Now, as democracy, you know, like, if you're like me, you were sort of taught that this was all invented. It's, you know, sort of as a golden age. It's important to understand that it was a direct democracy, direct democracy, one man, one vote. You had to vote by law. And the way you got rid of somebody was by claiming that they were corrupt, and then the state would confiscate all their property and exile them, right? And so rather than going on TV and debating during an election, um, you actually got rid of your opponent that way. Um, it only lasted 100 years, about 100 years, and then it completely collapsed, uh, where Rome, as we'll see, was not a direct democracy but a republic that lasted 500 years. Um, Pretty astonishing, actually. So if we strip this back, if we strip the uh, political space back, what we see then are sort of these municipal buildings running along here. We have clean water coming in, and we have the sewer that is constructed here going out. We also have boundaries that are marking the entrances to the agora in which only citizens were admitted. And then we have this... Um, Diagonal Street, which leads up to the ancient city, the high city, the Acropolis, uh, which uh, slowly is given over to a purely memorial function, religious and memorial function. Uh, A.E.J. Morris calls the, the Agora the living heart of the polis. Now, the polis was at this time sort of like a small nation, meaning that it had territory that it controlled around it. It had allied cities and so forth, but it was not a nation in the sense of, of France or you know, China or the United States or something. It was not a nation in terms of the modern nation state. Um, it was a self-sufficient city state of which there were many, and they were very different. So we will focus on Athens as an example for two reasons. One is uh, it's very, very different than, say, Sparta, Sparta was sort of the North Korea of the ancient Greek world. Um, you gave up your children at a very early age to be trained by the state. You didn't own property, etc. It was uh, quite militaristic, very different from Athens, but primarily because nothing much remains of it. Whereas Athens, of course, has multiple remains, and a hundred or more years of systematic excavation has revealed a lot about it. So they're very different. They were all not all the same. So here we see a model of the Dromos or Panathenaic Way, the Stoa Basilios, uh, Temple of Apollo, the Father, Petros, and then a Metroon, Metroon, which is the mother of the gods. 
And then the council house or bulletarian with its sort of dining room that is not yet round, and then presumably the heliaea, the, uh, the sort of space of judges, and then the southeast fountain house. Um, I have inscribed two of these horoi have been found. The, the boundary stone is called a horos, and uh, there we see um, the H-O-R equivalent in Greek script, horos written in a style called bustaferon, meaning it's written around like this. And some of archaic Greek, ancient Greek is very difficult to read um, because it doesn't have punctuation. So <laughs> you have to sort of figure out when you're at the end of a word. Um, however, unlike the Latin-based languages, it's fascinating because if you can read modern Greek, you can read ancient Greek. Whereas if you go back in English, even to the Middle Ages, and listen to you know, Chaucer spoken in the way he wrote, you can't even understand what he's saying, right? It doesn't even make sense. Um, for some reason, the Greek language set was, was, it didn't evolve in the same way that many other languages did. And what that says is boundary I am of the Agora. All right? Horoi, M tes, um, Agora. See that? Alpha, gamma, omega, rho, alpha, sigma. Agoras. Well, I'm going to stop here for a moment, and I'm going to ask the question rhetorically then, where does this conception of space come from, of political space? We have read Aristotle, who's writing some 200 years later, um, and I am speculating that it comes from the evolution of the religious space of the Greek theater. And so I have written some elaborate version of this that is in your course folder uh, as required reading. And um, the theater that remarkably comes down to us today, even the words, the terms, the uh, uh, proscenium, the, the scenery, um, the orchestra, the um, uh, theatron or the seating and so forth, uh, these words actually come down to us remarkable, in remarkable ways to the present, to the present, um, even though they go through a long sort of period of slumber. Um, this was associated with the cult of Dionysus. And without going into detail on Dionysus, that's in the reading, uh, I will say that he was um, uh, an interesting god. He was the male god of fertility, of things, um, of spring, of the, the rising of the sap, of dew, of wine. His Roman equivalent became Bacchus. Uh, so he was associated with the coming of spring. There were two, originally four, but it was reduced to two great festivals. One was held in the middle of March, and the other was held around December the 21st. What happens on those two dates? Right, this is winter time, right, in December. So you had a great Dionysia, a great festival uh, to give him a great party, to make sure that he was happy and would want to come back. And then you had a great sort of party in the spring to kind of conjure him up and bring him back. Because what would happen if he didn't come back? Well, the hens won't lay, uh, the sheep won't molt, uh, the crops won't grow, and you're in uh, a lot of trouble. And so you had to make sure that he came back. Now, he was not an ordinary god because he lived, did not live on Olympus. Uh, his spirit sort of walked among us, um, and in the winter he lived down below, subterranean. His... Um, Female equivalent, uh, of course, was associated with the cult of Eleusis, the Eleusian, the Eleusinian mysteries, and uh, was Demeter and Persephone, and there's a whole sort of mythology about that. Um, but Dionysus was born of a mortal woman who had had an affair with Zeus. Uh, Zeus was a great philanderer, you know, and he sort of would look down and he'd say, aha, uh -huh, okay, and he would sort of appear in a celestial form in disguise, and he would seduce you. And then uh, you would have offspring. And, and these were half man, half god, called heroes. Uh, Hercules is the product, actually, of Hera, Heracles, and a mortal, because she's jealous of her husband, Zeus. In any event, um, the woman is named Semele. And um, Semele is a mortal, and Hera finds out about this. And she's terrible, terribly upset. She convinces Zeus that he has to um, appear to Semele in his celestial form.
uh, which he does. And the sight of him burns her to a crisp, all right? He realizes at that point that she is with child. He takes out um, his finger, and he opens his thigh, and he removes the fetus, and he carries the child to term in his thigh. So Dionysus is half man, half God, and he is born twice. He is born out of the corpse of Semele, and he is born again in the thigh of Zeus. All right. So um, he's never at home on Olympus, but he was worshipped. His The headquarters of his cult was at a place called Thebes. Uh, it's interesting that the headquarters of Osiris' cult was at a place called Thebes, one in Egypt, the other in Greece. All right. Um, so um, originally at Thebes, everyone, and this goes back to the Bronze Age, participated in this ritual. And uh, every male in the village um, during these great uh, Dionysian festivals would actually dance around an altar in which the cult statue of the god would be placed. Uh, songs were sung, a, a sort of tragodia, from which our word tragedy comes from, which was sung in the fall uh, when he went away. Uh, and um, then there's a parodos, a parody, uh, which is actually occurring in the spring when he comes back. Well, by the Archaic Age, um, the villages began to grow once these Dorian invasions had settled down and the Sea Peoples had been dispensed with or absorbed or taken over. We're not sure. Um, and as the village grew, it became impossible to, um, to have every male between the ages of, say, 18 and 28 participate in this thing. And so, or everybody in the village, this is everybody, I'm sorry. So they got into a position where each family would appoint a male to represent them. And I think this is a critical moment because this is a moment where the concept comes that I'm going to appoint you to represent us in this public ceremony. You will stand in for me, right? You follow me? You will represent me. And when you did that, you got then a space that we see here with the birth of the spectator and then this group is known as the Chorus. Again, uh, it's awfully close to Horus, who was uh, Osiris' uh, son who helped um, Isis bring Osiris back to life, twice born also. And then in the third fa phase, at some point, this becomes, this ritual becomes uh, solidified into, uh, with a leader, a person called a Coryphaeus. This is where our word choreographer comes from, right? Uh, a Coryphaeus, and the Coryphaeus was the leader. And um, this then eventually, um, the table was moved so that the altar could be placed in front of the table. Um, and then the Coryphaeus, as we see finally here by 600, um, we see here, where this table, the Coryphaeus is on the table, the chorus is dancing around the orchestra, and the spectator is ac actually up on the hillside watching the whole thing. And we get this form, which is the proskenion here that we see, the skene that we see here, the activities of the god can be displayed, and so on and so forth. It seems to me, if we look at this, there are too many coincidences between the names of this political space, this flat space called the orchestra, these council houses, which are overlooking it on a slight rise overlooking the orchestra, and its similarity, in fact, to uh, the theater, um, which was associated, of course, with these religious ceremonies, thus the name theater, right? the space of. And here we have the Theater of Dionysus, which is on the south slope of, um, of the Acropolis today. And we see the temple where the god sort of uh, the cult statues were held. And then here we see the entire elaborate development here of the parodos, the parrot coming in, the parade. And then the theatron that we see sort of um, circling the orchestra with the chorus dancing around. By the classical age, um, it had become secularized to some degree. It had evolved into a kind of secular form where um, there were actually plays that were com competitions um, that were held in Athens to um, um, in which you win a prize, right? The competition. 
And uh, with that, you had professional playwrights that began to develop. So all the plays we have of Aristophanes and Sophocles and so forth are coming from this period after it had sort of been secularized. We have a tragedy and a comedy and so forth in the cycles that actually are derived from this ancient, um, this ancient uh, religious ritual. So it seems to me that this becomes, in a sense, the kind of armature uh, with which, there's the orchestra, with which um, the um, agora develops conceptually. That the idea that Cleisthenes had was that you would, in fact, map the notion of these eponymous uh, uh, tribes, these, these leaders of each of the dem, which were then built up into filii and then ultimately into, these, into this tribal council that they would actually then stand in for, that your political leader would stand in for the entire family in this council, and eventually that developed into what we know as Athenian democracy. Um, as I said, it did not last long. Alexander the Great, it had collapsed. He came in to fill that vacuum, and uh, the Hellenistic age began um, where Alexander conquered uh, much, of the, much of the world. Uh, in the last five minutes, then, let's just look at how this arranges itself in space. We begin to get uh, uh, buildings, these long stoa, which are added. Ed Bacon makes a big deal out of this shaft of space. I think he is uh, imagining that. Um, and then in the uh, Hellenistic period, we get a, an addition uh, of the stoa here. The stoa tended to be market buildings. So on one side of the... Um, uh, of the Agora, uh, facing out into the orchestra with this portico coming all the way across all these buildings. We have um, the Bulletarian or Council House, the Prytaneion, um, so on. It's all the, all the apparatus of government. I like to think of this as municipal row, right? These are all the sort of public buildings that are facing out. There we see the Tholos. Uh, here is an archaeological map from Travelos, um, great sort of drawings that he made. Showing the tholos, there's the kitchen. Uh, this is actually a later Hellenistic uh, meeting house, and there we see the Bulletarian, uh, which um, is, of course, in the shape of a theatron. There's the view from that area looking across the orchestra to the Stoa of Adelos, which was reconstructed beginning in 1933 on your lower left, up to the Acropolis, which by this point had become, in fact, the... Um, home of the patron of, um, of the city who offered her protection, the goddess of wisdom, Athena. Uh, and it was ceremonial and religious in nature. There we see the South Store, which is added on to the old Ilia, the Southwest Fountain House and Southeast Fountain House. And then finally, the Dromos, which is extending all the way down to Piraeus uh, through uh, the long walls. R. E. Weicherly makes an important point, I think, which makes an interesting contrast to Rome. He says that these walls were loosely flung about the city, and what that means is they are coming after the fact, whereas in the Roman world, the boundary of the city, the sacred enclosure, a very sacred enclosure called the Pomerium, is actually coming prior to occupation. Um, this is the Agora then in the Roman period, but I want to focus or conclude with the store of Adelos, this building, which we will come back to when we contemplate the notion of the basilica, this is what it looked like when Reconstruction began in 1933 by Brunier, um, who was the archaeologist who led the excavations. Um, I'm glad they reconstructed this building because it gives us some sense of what this enclosure was like on this large sort of platform. Uh, a whole school of philosophy called the Stoics developed, of course, along here, um, these sort of people moving back and forth with a speaker's platform actually facing out onto the agora with durable goods into the enclosures behind. Eventually, um, in this system of direct democracy, you simply got too much, um, there were too many people, everybody had to participate, and so they built uh, another space, which is again a theatrical type space, which is a, in English absolutely unpronounceable, uh, called Pnex. That's the best I can do, sorry. And um, then today, I just wanted to show you what the archaeological map is so that you can appreciate the length of time it took me to unpack all of this to try to make it comprehensible. Um, are there any questions? Any challenges, any questions? <clears throat> 
All right, part on the theater, and you understand where I'm going with this. This is not something I would publish. I do not think I, it's a sustainable argument. I think um, the truth is we don't know where this kind of political space came from. We do know that it developed, and we do know um, that it was ridiculed by the Persians, for example, who said, you know, um, we spend our time in court sort of, you know, drinking wine and reading poetry. We don't dance around in these dusty places uh, like these stupid people over there do. Nonetheless, I think the idea of this, that is, the idea that you actually have a representational form of people, of government, in which people are actually um, you know, standing in for you, and the fact that it required its own space becomes the a sort of critical apparatus in which then this public space, uh, and public is not a stable term, as we will see throughout the semester. It's not a stable, stable term, but public space which had a political function in which your identity was a citizen is actually something that haunts us all the way down through time um, into the present and something that is still, uh, you know, in places where revolutions occur, right, are in the public square. So um, I think it behooves us then to speculate a little bit on perhaps how that came into being. And I'm speculating. Questions? No? Got to be one somewhere. No? Okay. I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>